Up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch, presented by the Cincinnati Business Courier, could one of Cincinnati's oldest media companies be up for sale? Where are the tellers? A bold new experiment in banking. And despite being shunned by the state, Pure Romance says Ohio is still for lovers. U.S. Bank Business Watch is next. Welcome to U.S. Bank Business Watch. I'm Brian Patrick. On the front page centerpiece story this week of the Business Courier, clear signal with a big question mark. Despite claims from its CEO that it's not up for sale, some media watchers and investment analysts say the time is right for the E.W. Scripps company to shop itself. Scripps is one of Cincinnati's oldest companies dating back from the 1870s. It's made the transition from an old line newspaper chain to a TV and digital media company. Speculation about Scripps future is coming at a time when the television industry is seeing a lot of buying and selling. As a result, investors are seeing a rapid increase in the share or the value of the shares. Scripps shares are up 32% since mid-June. Analysts say as much as one-fourth of Scripps current stock price is related to the possibility it could be acquired. Even though CEO Rich Bainey says the company is is not for sale. Scripps impact on the Cincinnati economy is large and growing. They've hired dozens of employees here this year alone. There are a few more dozen openings as it ramps up its locally based digital efforts. Scripps 2012 revenue $886 million. The company owns 19 TV stations, including WCPO-TV here in Cincinnati, along with some mid-sized newspapers. Any deal in which Scripps is on the selling end would more than likely hurt Cincinnati's economy and cost us plenty of high-paying jobs. So even though the CEO says it is not on the market, the primary duty of any public company is to increase shareholder value, and it looks like a sale would do just that. Business Courier reporter Steve Watkins wrote this story. Good to have you with us, Steve. Thanks, Brian. All right, so clear signal question mark. You say it's priced for sale, and yet Rich Bainey is flatly denying it's for sale. How do you get those two together? Yeah, they sound contradictory, don't they? Mm -hmm. um, the analysts say the company should consider a sale, and they also point out that the stock, compared to other TV station owner stocks, is one of the cheapest. And they think the reason is that Rich Bainey and the, the company's, um, the Scripps family that owns a lot of the shares, keep saying the stock is, uh, the company is not for sale, and the stock is priced lower, which makes it cheaper for somebody else to buy it. It's important to point out that Scripps sort of split itself a few years back. It took its uh, network affiliations, HDTV, the Food Network, off to, I think, Knoxville, Tennessee. And what's based here is now the television station, newspaper, as well as digital. That's right. Yeah, they, they took uh, a lot of those higher um, margin businesses, as you mentioned, the TV, cable TV networks, uh, split those off there in Tennessee. And yes, everything else is here. So what would shareholders stand to gain if they did so? Well, uh, a lot of the analysts talk about how the stock could get $21 a share uh, in a purchase. Right now, it's trading somewhere between 17 and 18, so that's a pretty nice uh, increase. And the other thing they point out is right now, even though the company says it's not for sale, the analysts say about 25% of the stock price is what they call a buyout premium, meaning some investors think it could be acquired, and so they've bid up the stock higher than it would be if everybody, every investor just thought there's no chance of it selling. So in watching that stock, that's kind of what tipped you off to this, uh, it sounds like. A exactly. That yeah. and the fact that all these other TV deals have been happening kind of in tandem. Uh, a few other acquisitions have happened in the TV market during the summer. Mm. That started not only Scripps' price, but other TV station owners' stock prices rising pretty sky high because investors think they could be the next one to be acquired. Well, there was a time when owning 19 television stations would make you a big TV company. Company, but not anymore. Those, those acquisitions really are creating mega 
companies, aren't they? Yeah, that's the trend right now. The big thing is that TV station owners want to get big, and it all has to do with their negotiating leverage when they get deals with uh, cable and satellite distributors. And so Scripps is mid-sized right now. They're the 14th biggest, although Rich Bainey, the CEO, says they're big enough that they could have done any of these deals that happened recently. They could have been the buyer as well. And how do you think they can grow over the next several years? Well, one of the things they are looking at is possibly acquiring another TV station. Also, they're putting a lot of money into their digital capabilities right now. They've spent about $25 million, or they will have this year. They've added more than 100 people, and they're doing a lot with their Internet presence, both with their TV stations and with their newspapers in Cincinnati and then across the country at their other markets. So this is a long-standing Cincinnati company. What are the possibilities that we won't see scripts in Cincinnati any longer? Well, it's a good question. It's really hard to say. And as we said, um, Rich Bainey, the CEO, he's also the chairman, and the Scripps family, we haven't touched on that. They own 90% of the stock. They all say they're going for the long term. They're not wanting to sell. And so there's probably a good chance they won't. Yeah. But the thing is, if they do get a really good offer, they are obligated to take a look at it and consider it. If it's good enough, they'd have to uh, accept it. A solid company. Very consistent as well. So we'll see. Thanks, Steve. Great story. Sure. Thanks, right. Brian. Another major employer in our region is getting a new CEO when Dave Dillon steps down January 1st. As we told you last week, Rodney McMullen will become CEO of the Kroger Company. He's been one of the company's top leaders for a decade. He started working for Kroger while he was in college. He was a part-time stock clerk at his local Kroger store, paying his way through the University of Kentucky to become the first member of his family to earn a college degree. He stayed with the company after graduation, working in a variety of roles, including his appointment as CFO in 1995. Wow, what a success story there. Well, if you use the Fifth Third Bank branch in Carew Tower downtown, you might be wondering, where are the tellers? Well, there aren't any. Fifth Third has launched the first of what will be 20 or so small branches it calls micro-format branches. It's mostly machinery and few people. There's no traditional teller line. Uh, what we have here today are a couple of personal bankers. Nick is one of them. Um, and we, we share a financial center manager with our branch across the street on Fountain Square. Um, but we have a lot of ATMs here that we didn't have before, including one that's, uh, that's right in front of me here in a, in a vestibule that's kind of out of the weather and has 24-hour access. Okay. Sullivan says this is the way customers want to interact with their bank and employees like Nick, who he referenced. When there are needs for complex transactions, the customer is directed to the Fountain Square branch, which is a block away. Sullivan said he expects Fifth Third to expand the micro branch concept to about 20 locations by the end of next year. Well, speaking of trends in how we do business, have you heard of co-working? Co-working involves individuals or small groups typically not employed by the same organization, all working out of an open shared space. It's sort of like working out of a coffee shop, maybe a little more professional. Locally, Centrifuge is planned over the Rhine headquarters. It's expected to be geared toward co-working. The region's oldest incubator, the Hamilton County Business Center, is also offering a co-working space with room for 12 companies. And a group called Platform 53 is hoping to open a co-working space in the region and has conducted two co-working experiments. After a few weeks of uncertainty and a still brewing battle with the state of Ohio, Loveland-based Pure Romance has decided that Ohio, not Kentucky, is for lovers, at least for its headquarters. The relationship enhancement company, valued at $100 million, had considered moving to Covington after Governor John Kasich backed out of an expected tax credit offer by the state of Ohio. The city of Cincinnati originally offered more than $350,000 in tax credits in exchange for Pure Romance bringing 116 new jobs to downtown over the next three years. To make up for the state and make the deal happen, the city nearly doubled its tax credit offer and Pure Romance has committed to being downtown for a total of 20 years. City and state legislators say they're wondering what's up with Governor Kasich. There's a lack of accountability. There's a lack of transparency. We don't know what they're doing. Here we've got another where everybody understood the same thing and all of a sudden it changes. What's going on? John Kasich, if you don't like Pure Romance's product line, then you don't have to work for them. But I will remind you that there are thousands of Cincinnatians and thousands of Ohioans who are out of work and looking for work. And the chase jobs away from here is not responsible. It's not good for our economy. It's not acceptable behavior.
The company's warehouse will stay in Loveland, by the way. Well, after nearly 50 years, the Johnson Investment Council will not be run by Tim Johnson. On Tuesday, Johnson plans to step back from his day-to-day -day duties running his namesake money management firm. He'll be replaced as president by Jason Jackman. The 71-year-old Johnson will remain chairman of the company, which is the city's biggest independent investment advisory firm. Johnson calls it a normal progression in the succession planning process. It started in 2001. Jackman is 42 and has worked at Johnson Investment for 20 years. The team doctor for the Cincinnati Reds is sounding an alarm about what he suggests could be a version of pay-to-play involving large health systems and high school sports. Dr. Dim Krem... Tim Kremchik says health systems are increasingly entering partnerships with high school athletic programs. He says hospitals are buying their way into the business, trying to cultivate a doctor and a business for that doctor. The hospitals pay the schools hundreds of thousands of dollars, and the schools use the funds for a variety of improvements to benefit their athletic programs. Kremchik is the volunteer team doctor at several local schools. University of Cincinnati students have a new place to live and hang out. City leaders took part in a ribbon cutting last week, celebrating the opening of a $20 million mixed-use project called Views on Vine, the beginning of the revitalization of Short Vine Street in Coryville. Over about a 20-year period, the, the, the street went into severe decline, and, and really businesses left, residents left, and, and, and those spaces were filled with people loitering. In addition to 104 apartment units now open, this project calls for adding more apartments and new businesses like Taste of Belgium. In December, changes to the streetscapes are expected to make the area look like it did in the 1800s with cobblestone streets and antique street lamps. More parking and wider sidewalks will also be added. So, what are the hottest, hardest to get into restaurants in Cincinnati? According to Open Table, the online reservation site, number one is David Falk's Nada, followed by Moorline Lager House, Seasons 52, Sato and Maggiano's Little Italy. For the top 10, be sure to visit our website, CincinnatiBusinessCourier.com. Up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch, new unemployment numbers are in, and they're looking pretty good for Ohio. And did you attend Oktoberfest Zinzanati this year? A whole lot of people did. Here's some news you might have missed if you're not reading the Business Courier online every day. Cincinnati's jobless rate improved in August to its best level since April. The unemployment rate for the 15-county Greater Cincinnati area fell to 6.7% from 7.1% in July, according to the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services. That improvement didn't reflect job growth in Cincinnati. More than 3,000 jobs were lost, according to the data. Government jobs, almost strictly involving education, tied to the start of the school year were the saving grace for the local economy in August. Nyer Properties plans to demolish this former Oldenburg Brewery Company facility here on Buttermilk Pike in Fort Mitchell. They're going to build a medical and office facility plus some retail. This festival hall and adjacent office building will come down next month. But the Montgomery Inn restaurant is on that site. It will not be demolished and will stay open during the construction. The new development will be called Buttermilk Square. Construction should begin in the summer of 2014. Well, this year's Oktoberfest, Cincinnati had the largest attendance of the 38-year history of the festival. Organizers say the weekend event experienced a record 600,000 people. That's a 20% increase from last year's estimated attendance of 500,000. This year was the first year the event opened on Friday. Star Trek actor George Takai also led the crowd in performing the mass chicken dance on Saturday. That is really goofy, but a lot of fun. Well, it's time of year again where the nation looks to Washington to witness the spectacle of the two houses of Congress and the president attempting to agree on something very important. In this case, we have two items, funding the federal government for the year ahead and the looming lifting of the budget ceiling that need agreement in the days ahead. Now, if the recent past is any guide, we should expect an 11th hour solution with plenty of twists and turns to walk us through what looks like uh, what it looks like for the folks in Washington is U.S. Bank senior equity strategist Jim Russell. He joins us for this week's Economic 360 report. Jim, good to have you back. Good morning, sir. Of course, we're all hearing rumblings about the 
a potential shutdown of the government. Sort this out for us. If yeah, you uh, as you mentioned, Brian, there are really two distinct issues. Number one, the federal uh, government will start shutting down in stages unless Congress can approve an appropriation to fund the federal government before October 1st, which is next Tuesday. Now, this is all confined to the federal government, has nothing to do with state and local, so that's an important distinction. The second thing that you mentioned is also crucial, and that is by October 17th, Congress will need to uh, vote to extend the budget ceiling. As people are aware, uh, the federal government spends more than it takes in in taxes and fees. Therefore, the federal government needs to borrow in the global capital market. So both of these things combined really are uh, on the headlines, will be in the headlines over the next couple of weeks. And I will tell you the politics around uh, both of these items uh, is pretty heavy duty. I think we're all very well aware of that. Now, as you look at this as an analyst, which of the two issues are more important, the, the budget for the next fiscal year or this lifting of the budget ceiling? Well, certainly they're both important. Uh, we did experience a 28-day shutdown of the federal government in 1995 and 1996. So that was extremely disruptive. And mm -hmm. again, we're staring that right in the face. But of the two, uh, we do think lifting of the budget ceiling, the deficit ceiling, will be the bigger deal of the two. And for this reason, uh, the uh, budget, the government needs to borrow in order to pay its bills. Uh, the debt that has already been taken on by the federal government needs to be paid down. Uh, holders of any treasury securities, China. Uh, people in the United Kingdom, people around the world have bought these securities. The day that the government defaults or is late on an interest payment will be a very, very negative series of events that I don't think we want to experience. Certainly the politicians are aware of that as well. You know, at the end of the day, we do think the federal government will be funded, no question there, and we think the budget ceiling will be lifted. By the way, that's at $16.7 trillion, and it's lifted on occasion. It's been lifted five times under the Obama administration. So it's one of those things that needs to be voted on on occasion. Again, the politics around here are pretty heavy duty, and almost anything can happen over the next three weeks is going to prove to be pretty noisy. Yet it's tempting for us here in Cincinnati to say that's going on in Washington, doesn't really affect us. Is there any impact on us? There sure is. And, and uh, I'll point to two. Uh, in Ohio, a ten, uh, excuse me, 11 percent of the uh, working population in Ohio work for the government. Of that particular uh, population, uh, uh, 10 percent of the government workers are federal workers. And this is what this is pertains to. Certainly those families will be watching developments along these lines very, very carefully. It makes for a nervous period. Uh, we found out just last Friday that consumer confidence has hit a five-month low. There's no question that business confidence will also uh, perhaps take a step back. Very likely we're going to see retail sales also be a little bit soft over this next three or four-week period, slowing the economy at a time where we really don't need this. So Washington is in a way causing a slowdown in the economy due to the uncertainty. Again, maybe not a constructive uh, scenario. A complicated issue. Jim Russell, you've done a great job of simplifying it for us. Thank you. Great to be with you. We appreciate you and U.S. Bank. Still to come on U.S. Bank Business Watch this morning, preventing this from happening. We'll be joined by Vice Mayor Roxanne Qualls talking about a new program that calls for renovating and rebuilding Cincinnati's oldest housing instead of tearing it down. And congratulations to Emily Roberts, one of this year's 40 Under 40 honorees. Emily is Corporate Sponsorship Manager for the Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber. Her first job, working at a bakery during high school.